Welcome to Forensic Friday, where I tell you one true crime case that was solved using forensic science all while doing, that's right, my makeup. Today's video will be featuring the Fruit Pie Filling Palette from You Come Be. Oh my god, Amazon. That's all I have to say. All the other items I'm using in this video will be linked in the description below. Please read the disclaimer. I am in no way, shape, or form a professional makeup artist, beauty guru, MUA, forensic pathologist, or anything in criminal law. I'm just the average girl at home like you, planning makeup and talking about true crime. So if you love true crime and makeup, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any of my future episodes. And let's get into today's case. Boop, boop, oh, girl, what's up? <laughs> this story takes place in Traverse, Michigan, or Travis, Michigan. I'm, I'm sorry, do not kill me if you're from there. I'm not from there. I'm actually from Chicago, which is close to there, but uh, I've never literally heard of that city. <laughs> so I'm really sorry if I say it wrong. Shame on me. Okay. So this spot was very well known for people who like to go sailing and fishing. It was like that kind of, you know, lake area. Now this is where Dan and Cynthia McDonald and their two teenage children lived. Now Dan, who was 58, was a retired police officer. He also worked part-time as a maintenance worker. And Cindy was a freelance writer. According to friends and family members, um, they seem to have a normal marriage. It, it's safe to say that Cindy was the boss. She was the one that was in charge of the entire household. She was leading everything, girl. You know, she was doing what she wanted to do. December 31st, 1998 was a, a very busy day for the McDonald family. At this time, their 18-year-old son, Patrick, was sleeping over at a friend's house and um, Dan had actually slept in late. Cynthia and her 20-year-old daughter spent the day shopping in Traverse City. Now, according to them, for the next several hours, they spent the time going from store to store shopping. They went to a department store, they went to a local office supply store, and they were just, you know, shopping around like normal people before COVID happened. They also went to a local beauty shop and on the way home, Cynthia decided that she was gonna go and pick up some, you know, some fast food. She got some hamburgers for the entire family. Where you go, girl? You go to McDonald's, you go to Mickey D's, you went to Burger King. What's your, what's your choice? What's your, what's your favor? Ooh, tell me what's your flavor. According to Cynthia, they returned home shortly after noon, and that is when they found Dan dead in his bed of a gunshot wound. And Cynthia called 911, and she was really distraught. She was just screaming and yelling, he's dead, he's dead, oh my God, I don't think he's breathing. Um, and she told the police, you know, we went out, to go shopping we just got back home and i found my husband you know dead in in the bed with gunshot wound to the head as you can imagine she was very very hysterical and then that is when her daughter kind of gets on the phone and starts to talk to the officer and her daughter is telling the officer like we do have guns in the house he is a retired police officer so there are guns in the house now when the investigators got there they found no gun near his body but um, his wallet was missing $700, so they kind of thought maybe it could be a robbery. That's a possibility. Police were able to corroborate Cynthia and her children's story. They were, in fact, all out the morning of the murders. Cynthia told police that she did expect that this was a robbery. However, police didn't find any forced entry into the home, so they couldn't really corroborate that theory. Police found that very suspicious and when they questioned Cynthia for a second time, this time she told police that she had a confession to make. Okay girl, what you done done? We know you done something. She had completely changed her story. 
she had said it wasn't a robbery, that in fact she had came downstairs in the morning and found that Dan had committed suicide. She told police that that morning, Erin, her daughter, was almost ready to go. And so she told Aaron, I'm going to go grab our coats and stuff and I'm going to get the car warmed up. Funny side note, I forgot when I used to live in Chicago that we always had to warm up the car and it took us like 15, maybe 15 minutes to warm up the car before we could actually drive it. I just remember that as like, wow, I've lived in California this long where that's not even an issue here for us. We, you never have to warm up a car here. Oh my God. Why do I feel like a Power Ranger right now? So anyway, she had told her daughter that she was gonna go, you know, get the car warmed up. And so uh, before she left, she went into their bedroom where Dan was to tell him, you know, I'm leaving, uh, we're about to leave and stuff like that. This is when she says she discovered Dan was dead and that he had committed suicide. I should start putting like trigger warnings in my videos, I guess, or at the beginning of the video. Warning, viewer discretion is advised. We may be talking about some shit that you are too sensitive to hear. What are we doing? Uh, I'm definitely a Power Ranger today. Definitely. But if I'm gonna be a Power Ranger, I'd rather be the purple one, I think. Was there a purple Power Ranger? I don't even think there was. Is there a purple Power Ranger? No. I believe there's only pink, red, yellow, green, and blue. Comment down below, what's your favorite Power Ranger? <laughs> Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. She also told police that she had found his gun, which doesn't make sense because where is the gun now? According to Cynthia, Dan had recently undergone a surgery for prostate cancer, which left him impotent. She also said that she found the suicide note and it said, I'm devastated over my prostate cancer and I want you to have the insurance money. Girl, really? I mean, I would have wrote a better note than that. It also said something to the effects of if, you know, they found out it was a suicide, that the children wouldn't get any of the money and the money, you know, the money would not be released and then the children would not be taken care of. And so according to Cynthia, she decided to destroy the suicide note because she didn't want the children to know most of all, but she also didn't want them to suffer if you know the police found out or investigators found out or the insurance company found out that you know it was a suicide i really don't know why insurance companies don't cover suicide or was that just back then i don't know now dan had a three hundred thousand dollar life insurance policy on him and according to cynthia they only got it for you know the kids college um tuitions but um, in the event that there was a suicide the uh, stipulations of that contract for the life insurance would be void like they could not get any of that money according to her that is the only reason why she altered the scene she wanted to respect Dan's wishes his last death wishes and so that is why she moves things around to make it look like a homicide. She wiped the prints off of her husband's gun and she just continued to go on the shopping trip with her daughter just so, you know, she wouldn't bring any suspicion to herself or to the crime scene. Uh, girl, I don't know. Cynthia, I don't know, girl. That sounds a little bit more than insensitive like for me not calling the police and just continuing on with your day with your shopping spree and trip with your daughter in a light-hearted spirited mood where did she go going to beauty salons and getting your hair done and buying hamburgers for the entire family when you know you're gonna return home to your husband who committed suicide does not sound like a really good wife to me just doesn't sound right. 
I mean, you, in, in my head, you already set up the crime scene to make it look like a suicide. Why not call the police then? Why not just start screaming and call the police and say, hey, I found my husband dead and say it was a suicide. Why go throughout your entire day, continue your shopping and your fun, nice time with your daughter, buy hamburgers as though, you know, nothing's wrong. And then later on, I don't know. Oh my God, people be killing me, dude. suspicious for her to call the cops immediately um, she had obviously uh, went into his room and so yeah I just I don't think that doesn't even make sense I can't really judge anyone's behavior because we all react differently especially to grief and to shock we react differently but I'm just I'm so confused because her rendition when she got on the phone to call the police it was so overdone and so hyped up and so like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. So it seemed like to me that she actually was the type of woman that would break down and, and do that. And so like part of me is like, okay, I understand she could probably react differently. Everybody reacts differently, but then why when you call the police, you're acting in hysteria, okay? But then when it actually happened and you were there with him, you were calm and concise and made concise decisions. I don't know, girl, get out of here with that. Cynthia claimed to have thrown her husband's revolver into a nearby field. However, search dogs and metal detectors could not locate it. Like they didn't pick anything up on the metal detectors and the search dogs didn't pick anything up either, any sense, or was able to detect it at all. The fact that Cynthia had concealed the murder weapon and essentially got rid of it, combined with the fact that she knew that her husband was dead and she altered the scene of the crime, this was a huge indicator to the investigators that something definitely was not right. According to friends and family members of Dan, they saw no signs to indicate that he was going to commit suicide. He wasn't depressed. Um, he was actually planning on purchasing a boat and a new car. So these are, I, you can never really say, you know, cause uh, just because someone isn't, doesn't appear to be depressed or doesn't appear to, you know, to have problems doesn't mean that they don't, so you can never say everybody acts differently, so you can't really say because he wanted to buy a new boat or a new car that he wasn't planning on committing suicide, although I will say that those are huge indicators that he was happy with his life and he was planning to live and not die. During the autopsy, examiners looked for signs that this was a suicide X-rays revealed that the bullet was still inside Dan's skull. This meant that the bullet wound was an entry wound. This led examiners to believe that the wound could have been caused by a, another person, especially the angle and location of the bullet in the back of the head. Someone who's committing suicide aren't going to shoot themselves in the back of the head. I feel like that's just too complicated. They usually go for, I don't know if I can even discuss this in this video because I feel like YouTube will shut me down, but they always shut me down. They always demonetize me. With most suicide cases, especially ones that use firearms, it's usually in the mouth, underneath the chin, at the temple, something like that. Um, it's very rare in those cases where they will put it to the back of their head like this. Most people will try to find the easiest way to get it done, the quickest and easiest way to get it done. And that to me is just like, it's not a, a lot, a lot of extra work, but it is a little bit of extra work. You know what I mean? But Cynthia's lawyer argued that this wasn't indication of a homicide, but that Dan himself may have played a role in the deception of the case. I mean, really? 
You got the nerve to sit up here, sir, and blame the damn victim. Blame the victim, the man that is dead. Of course, because he can't talk. He can't speak for himself, right? Like, I, I can't believe, I can't believe that. I can't believe that. I'm sorry, this lawyer is an absolute jackass. And I'm sorry I had to curse, but like, seriously, he really, just listening to him really, really irritated me. He's like, oh, if anyone had the um, capability of inflicting a wound on themselves and making it look like it was something that it wasn't, uh, it would be a police officer. And as we know, Dan was a retired cop. So he's like, yeah, it would be, it would be Dan because he's a retired police officer. He's just a, 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 a uh, there's only one way to say it. He's a dick. He is a major dickity 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 dickhead for that one. I'm so sorry, but he really is. But then police discovered something else. Cynthia wasn't just a freelance writer. She was a freelance murder mystery writer. That's right, you guys. I said she was a murder mystery writer. I'm not planning to kill anybody, just so y'all know. Boy, I have to say I did not see that coming. Well, this is getting interesting. Police also learned that she made some really inappropriate nasty derogatory remarks about them according to friends she was at a, a neighborhood cocktail party where she made this remark she said you know you could commit a murder and the police in northern michigan wouldn't be smart enough to catch you of course that statement did not sit well with the police so investigators decided to take a closer look at cynthia's murder mystery stories hoping that they'd be able to find some clue now it's time to go into the palette but anyway back to the story i was dropped it i forgot to mention this early on but it is a really important note to put in the medical examiners did note that the bullet entered Dan's head from left to right, which means whoever had shot the gun had to be left-handed, and Dan, in fact, was right-handed. Forensic scientists began their investigation by taking a look at the blood splatter. Scientists take into consideration the fact that no matter the cause of the blood, whether it be a pool of blood or, you know, a gunshot to the head, um, the blood does move in a straight line. However, it is on a 360 degree radius. So it goes out completely in all directions. Now the blood that comes back from the pressure that was being applied is called the back spatter, but there was no blood on either of Dan's hands. Now Dan's arms were clutching his pillow and his hands tucked underneath his body. His arm was clearly defined by a pool of blood. I don't know what I'm doing here, but I've seen people do this, so we're gonna try it today. This was proof that Dan's arm was never moved after the shooting. There was no change in the blood stain pattern to indicate that his arm had been in any other position, either at the time of death or after. So this told investigators that his body was in the exact same position at the time that it was shot, which meant that he probably definitely was not the shooter. I mean, it's not impossible, but it definitely is very hard to do. And even if it had been done that way, if he was able to shoot himself that way, according to medical Medical examiners the ending position of his hand would have been on top of his head instead of underneath his body underneath the covers you know it, it would have been rested on the top of his head without any blood or gunpowder residue like I don't know it was very very unlikely they also found gunpowder and a bullet hole in the pill laying next to Dan's body. This indicated to police that the gun was pressed against the pillow at the time it was fired. So that meant that Dan would have had to be able to hold the pillow whilst shooting himself in the back of the head on the left side, not even on the right side, on the left side of his head. It's just like, 
Does this man have three arms or what? Dan's death was ruled a homicide. So police took a closer look at Cynthia and Dan's relationship. A look into the McDonald's finances, they found that they were actually spending more money than they were bringing in. And they found that Cynthia was making quite a few large purchases. She was buying computers and other technical things to do her writing with. They also found that Dan managed a trust fund for a mentally handicapped family member. And just a year before Dan's death, they found that more than $50,000 had been taken out of this trust fund account. And the bank had been demanding answers. A copy of bank statements showed a withdrawal of $500 to $1,000 every other day until the entire account was virtually depleted and the bank's security surveillance cameras picked up the person who was responsible. It was none other than Cynthia. You guessed it. So police went back to interview the McDonald's 20 year old daughter Erin and she actually recalled something unusual that morning. She said that she was in the shower the morning her father was killed and she recalls that her mother came into the shower to, well, not into the shower, that, wow, that would be very, very weird. <laughs> no, she came into the bathroom to check on her multiple times, like three or four times, but she just felt like this was very odd and out of character. And her mom also turned up the radio super loud. She also told them that she heard what she believed to be was like a car, backfiring or a bang or someone in like an accident but it was just like a pop noise that she heard or a banging noise now inside of the mcdonald's home police found a bunch of textbooks that had information that cynthia was researching for the next murder mystery story she was writing there are books called body trauma armed and dangerous there were even chapters and books that were highlighted entitled Accidental Shooting. There were other books that were also highlighted with chapters called, you know, Who Shot Whom, Premeditated Killing, things like that. Like, girl, she busted at this point. Like, So prosecutors argued that Cynthia got these books with the intention to plan Dan's murder. They believe the motive was money. She was in financial hardship. She was stealing money from her husband's relatives trust fund and the bank was coming after them. So police believe that Dan may have confronted her about this and told her that he was planning on going to the authorities and clearing the whole thing up and paying the money back or getting things fixed and this would have put a huge dent in Cynthia's plans. Girl was not going to have it. She wasn't going to have that. Cynthia McDonald was charged with first degree murder. She pleaded not guilty. Now in her defense she included a testimony from one of the forensic scientists and he said there was a chance that Dan could have shot himself in the back of the head using his right arm on the left side and he did a little demonstration to show how this was possible in court. This forensic scientist expert also pointed out that Dan's hands were not analyzed for gunpowder residue so there is a possibility that gunpowder could have been on his hands. They just didn't do a test for it. If they had done a test for gunpowder residue on his hands, this may have proved that he did in fact fire the fatal shot. But forensic scientists on the prosecution side argue that um, they didn't really need to test for gunpowder because gunpowder residue can land on really anything that's in close proximity to the murder weapon. It wasn't a test that was routinely performed. Her daughter Erin said to show no mercy to her mother Cynthia. Erin gave a very emotional statement that day in court and she said that she couldn't believe that this had happened to her family and she thought that her parents had a very loving relationship and she just really didn't understand. She also requested that her mother get the maximum sentence. Thanks to forensic science and some good police work, Cynthia McDonald was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. What did you guys think about this case and my makeup look? 
please let me know in the comments down below. If you like videos like these, check out my last episode. I'll leave it linked on the screen right here or right here. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next week with another Forensic Friday episode. Bye!